Corporate finance is the study of the management of money in the corporate environment. Hopefully this video will help you read the first chapter in your finance textbook and introduce some pretty advanced topics in a user-friendly way. Big picture, in the financial environment there are providers and there are users. I like to think of them as savers and spenders. Now those spenders might be a sole proprietorship, a business owned by one person, or a partnership, a business owned by several people. But the problem with those is the notion of unlimited personal liability. Something goes horribly wrong, the people running those businesses could lose everything. A lot of the business in the United States is done in the corporate fo format so that there's limited personal liability. And there's two types of corporations. There's the closely held one where a family owns all the shares, let's say, and the publicly traded corporation. And that's the one we're going to look at in finance, the one where the shares are traded on the open market so the owners could be anybody. And why does the saver give their money to the spender? Because the spender will invest that money and do something with it that will generate a return to the saver. And if down here on this x-axis is the risk, the higher the risk, as we go out here, the higher the required return. Before a uh, saver will take a bigger risk, they'll need the, at least the possibility of a bigger return. And if a saver is looking at a corporation, theoretically, they will evaluate that corporation by looking at their future free cash flows. The cash flows that are left after the corporation pays its operating costs and its taxes and maintains their current and long-term assets. They'll find the present value, the value today of those future free cash flows. And conceptually, that will be the value of the corporation. And how do the dollars go from the savers to the spenders? You might lend to your cousin $100,000 to start their business. You might just do that directly. Or your cousin might take their company public and sell shares to the public through an investment banker like Goldman Sachs or Merrill Lynch. And, or you could just take your savings down to the local bank and your local commercial bank will take your money and lend it out to uh, spenders. And there's two basic ways for a saver to invest in a corporation debt and equity. Debt is when the company borrows money and so the saver simply lends money to the corporation. This might this would be an example of a corporate bond. It's an IOU. It has an interest rate and a due date. There's also uh, equity. So the company sells shares of itself. It is now owned by its shareholders. Common stock has new, no due date on it, no interest rate, no promise of a dividend. And then there's preferred stock which is part equity and part debt. It doesn't have a due date, but it does have a dividend rate. Like this is a 10% um, preferred stock on a $250 par value. So the company is saying, we'll do our best to pay you $25 every year. This example happens to be convertible preferred. So that means that at some point in the future, the holder of this piece of paper can convert it from preferred stock into a certain number of common shares of stock. And where does a saver buy shares of stock? Where does a saver buy bonds of a, co a corporation? Well, uh, there are three major stock markets. There's the New York Stock Exchange. That's a face-to-face -face market. There's the NASDAQ. That's a computerized market. And there's also uh, the NYSE MKT, which used to be called the American Stock Exchange. And so savers can go there to buy and sell shares. The first time a company issues shares, it's called a primary offering, and the money from those sales go to that company. But thereafter, when the shares trade in the secondary market, that money goes between the shareholders as they sell the shares back and forth. The company doesn't get any direct benefit from the sale of those shares in the secondary market. And your first chapter of your finance book might talk about securitization. That's the conversion of a bunch of smaller loans into other marketable securities to be sold to other investors. And that's when we started to run into trouble in 2007. In the old days, the bank would lend you money for your home 
and they would hang on to that loan and simply collect the principal and interest over the next 30 years. But that changed, and so banks were originating these loans, loan officers were originating these loans, mortgage brokers were originating these loans, but not hanging on to them. They were selling them to other people. And these larger banks were taking big pools of them and carving them up in different ways to securitize them. Regulators approved of these much lower lending standards for mortgage, so people didn't have to have a high income to qualify for uh, mortgages. The Fed kept rates low, so as long as rates were low and people could make their payments, all was good. But what happened is people bought bigger homes than they really could afford. They had these adjustable rate mortgages, and now when the rates started to tick up a little bit, they couldn't make their payments. The appraisers were relaxed because they didn't appraise these homes properly. They kind of assumed that uh, home uh, prices would keep going up. And the rating agencies didn't do their job. A lot of these things were below investment grade. In other words, high risk investments, yet they were rated as if they were above investment grade and not high risk investments. And credit default swaps were unregulated. A lender who wants to protect themselves will enter into a credit default swap and say, I'm gonna pay a little bit of an insurance policy here in case my borrower doesn't pay me. I wanna collect from you, the issuer of the credit default swap like AIG issued a lot of these things. Unfortunately, people not even involved in the original lending transaction bought into these credit default swaps. And so when the borrowers started to default on their loans, AIG, who had written a lot of these insurance policies, couldn't make their payments and had to be bailed out by the federal government. You might be thinking, how could this happen? Aren't there regulations to prevent this from happening? There's always this tension between more regulation or less regulation. And after a disaster, like the stock market, stock market crash in 1929, there was more regulation in the form of the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. But as human beings, we get further distance from those crises and we think, eh, maybe less regulation is better. Then 2007 comes along and we realize, well, maybe more regulation is better. And so we pass the Dodd-Frank Act. So there's this constant tension as the federal government tries to exercise just enough regulation. Okay, big picture, savers are moving money to spenders who are investing that money in, let's say, corporations. And the spender's job, the management of the corporation's job is to maximize shareholder wealth. And one way to do that is to increase free cash flow so that the present value of those future free cash flows is as high as possible. And to do so ethically and with respect for our planet and the people on it.